In this segment, I'm giving a crash course on economics for engineers, as I call it. And the reason for this is that if we want to understand what makes information markets special, we first need to understand normal markets. So this is a helicopter tour of classical economics as it was understood from the times of Adam Smith until the 1940s. Now here, we're interested only in microeconomics, which is how people and firms react to incentives. We're not going to talk about macroeconomics such as growth or exchange rates. So how do normal markets work? That is, say, the market for coal or the market for potatoes. Well, as a concrete example, let's um, think about how the coal market might have worked in, say, Newcastle in the 1840s. You might have had, for the sake of simplicity, three representative suppliers and three representative customers. First, on the supply side, you'll have an open cast mine that might cost two shillings per tonne to operate. Then you might have a small deep mine which costs five shillings a tonne and then your most high cost supplier might be that people would go out onto the beach with baskets and collect coal that was washed in by the sea from underground seams but they wouldn't do that unless they could get eight shillings a tonne um, in return for their labour. Now you might have three um, customers for the coal, you might have merchants who would put it on boats and export it to London and they'd only do that if they could buy it for three shillings a tonne or less. You'd have households who would use coal for heating their houses in winter, but they might pay a maximum of eight shillings a ton, and if it was more than that, they might go out and gather wood. And then you'd have blacksmiths, and blacksmiths would be prepared to pay quite a lot for coal, because without coal they couldn't run their forges and they couldn't earn a living. So the interesting insight here is that the market price determines who's going to produce and who's going to consume. So in summer, when there's little demand for coal, the households aren't burning it then there's going to be a baseline demand for export and of course there'll be demand from blacksmiths as well but most of the demand will come um, from export and so that's going to be satisfied by the open cast mine and um, if demand never goes above its capacity then the small deep mine is going to be closed and nobody's going to gather coal but when winter comes around households demand coal and if they demand um, enough coal that the small deep mine opens then that will open and if they demand more coal than the small deep mine can produce then the price will go up to eight shillings a ton and people will start gathering coal on the beaches so the insight here is that the price of coal is set by the marginal um, demand and the marginal supply the last supplier to come onto the market and uh, the last customer to be satisfied and the demand can fluctuate with um, exogenous factors such as weather and it can also evolve in the long term with technology and investment. So let's try and bundle that up into an overall supply curve. And in the next slide we see a typical supply curve um, where a firm which wants to manufacture something um, will start off with certain fixed costs and then as they produce more their average cost goes down. And then when they hit up against capacity constraints, their costs go up because of overtime and so on. So our small deep mine, for example, in the, in the previous slide, they've got certain fixed costs that have got to be paid to keep it in business, like pumping out the water. Then there's labour costs for hauling out particular uh, baskets of coal. And then once you hit capacity and you have to put on extra shifts, that costs you more money. So you end up with the supply curve that we see here, which goes down and then goes up again. Now, in the long run, of course, as we see in the next slide, um, firms can increase capacity uh, by building more factories. Somebody who owns a coal seam can dig more mines. Somebody who's making cars uh, can open factories in other countries. And in the long run, this can give nearly constant fixed costs and can thus give constant returns to scale as the firm or industry expands. But when you look at information goods and services, the um, technology has an effect because the marginal cost to Microsoft, for example, of copying one more instance of Windows or of Office is very, very small. And so once they have paid their huge fixed costs of actually writing the product, their average costs keep on going down. And this means um, that marginal costs may never rise. And this means that information goods and services firms can get ever-increasing returns to scale. 
And this brings us on to the next slide, which is really the key slide for understanding classical economics. How many firms will there be? Well, on this side, we see um, in green the market demand um, that's faced uh, by all the firms acting together. And let's assume that the market clearing price for the environmental conditions that we've got is P star. Now, if you're an individual firm, then the demand that you face is given by the black curve. Uh, because if you um, sell at any price uh, above the market clearing price P, the demand's going to be zero. And at any price below P star, you're going to face all the demand, which is what's happening on the right-hand part of the black curve. Now, your marginal cost is given by the red curve, and your profit is maximized when you set your output so that its marginal cost equals the price P star. That's the place where MC cuts P star um, in the uh, graph here at the manufactured quantity Y star. And this is the key insight, which explains, among other things, why, for example, Wikipedia is free, while its predecessor, the Encyclopedia Britannica, costs money. And it's this, that in the classical synthesis, prices are set where supply and demand curves intersect in competitive markets. And P star will be the marginal cost of the marginal supplier. And if the marginal cost of the marginal supplier is zero, then that's going to be the price. But in a classical market, of course, the price is non-zero, and by 1900, people thought that they had understood um, the invisible hand, and the only thing that they had to worry against was how they should guard against monopoly. And there were already in those days some monopolies, such as the railways, which caused significant problems, and people worried about that. Now, before we can think about monopoly, um, there's one interesting minor point here. That what do we mean by optimal? What do we mean by efficiency? Well, the key idea here goes back to the Italian economist 100 years ago, Vilfredo Pareto. And his idea was that a Pareto improvement is any improvement in the state of affairs which makes someone better off without making anybody else worse off. And a system is called Pareto optimal when there are no more Pareto improvements possible. Now this is actually a rather weak condition because both pure monarchy and pure communism are Pareto optimal. In pure monarchy, where the king owns everything, you can't give anybody else anything at all without making the king worse off, and he might not like that. And in pure communism, where everybody gets exactly the same, then you can't give anybody any more without making somebody else worse off. So this is a very weak condition, um, which gives us a very, very broad concept of efficiency. But given this rather broad concept, there's a couple of interesting theorems that were due to Kenneth Arrow and Gerard de Bruyne in 1948, the first and second theorems of welfare economics. And the first theorem says that market equilibrium is Pareto optimal. And the second theorem says that any Pareto optimal allocation can be achieved by market forces. Now, the interesting thing about this for us is that um, Arrow and de Bruyne proved a number of conditions which have to hold for markets to be efficient. And these include, first, that there should be complete property rights, in other words, no externalities. Second, that there should be complete information, that everybody who's playing in the market should know as much as everybody else. The third is that actors should be rational, that they shouldn't be moved by emotion, but they should simply cold-bloodedly pursue their own best interests. Um, the fourth is that there should be no transaction costs, that is, that buying and selling uh, shouldn't um, impose any costs of themselves. And then there are some technical conditions, such as convex preferences, which we're not going to worry about. So in summary, our quick tour of classical economics has shown that markets are often efficient, but they can fail if property rights are incomplete, that is, if transactions have side effects, and they can also fail if people have incomplete information, or for that matter, if people are irrational. And we're going to discuss these next.